Amen. Um, Jeremy is going to hand out uh, the handouts for tonight. Just quick before we get started, if we don't finish one, please be diligent to bring them back for the next week Um, because we tend to run out if we don't do that. But at any rate, um, as he hands these out and we get ready to prepare for tonight, if you open your New Testaments to Acts chapter 2, as we get ready to take a look at verse number 16, Uh, is where we're going to pick up here shortly. Um, Something came to mind before we get into uh, Luke recording Peter's version of the sermon or Peter's words in this sermon uh, that I wanted to share with you briefly to help with the overall view of the importance of this sermon on the day of Pentecost. And uh, I was, I actually pulled out one of my old Bibles because we're in Sunday mornings were in Revelation, and we're getting ready to start into chapter 2 and start taking a look at the seven churches of Asia. And I don't know about you all, but I write in my Bibles a lot. And I write in them, and I use them until they do this, and they start falling apart, and then I get another one and start all over again. At any rate, as I was looking through this, I came across in Acts chapter 2 some notes I had written And I had to go back and date this, but in 1997, I wrote some notes from a gospel sermon I heard from a preacher by the name of Brother Ray Vaughn. Um, Brother Ray Vaughn came uh, to our congregation. His son lived in Prescott, and he was there often to visit with his son. Mark Vaughn serves as an elder in the Lord's Church. That's his son. Uh, Ray was a preacher of the gospel for over 40 years and an elder himself. And it was common practice in our day that if a preacher came to visit and we knew he was a sound preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we invited him to preach. And this was the case when he showed up and he was invited. Him and my dad had known each other for many years and we invited uh, Brother Ray to preach. And he stood up and he opened his Bible to Acts chapter 2 and he preached what I'm going to share with you tonight. A little bit more sermon version that I'm going to share it with you, but I want to share this with you because it was so poignant to me that it changed the way I preached. I preached at Maryvale before Ray came in Phoenix for over a year. And like many gospel preachers, I chose a topic and I, I chose some points I wanted to talk about in the topic and selected scripture to support the topic and then had a conclusion. We're a very common way to preach. But after this sermon, after... Ray shared this, I threw all those old notes away, and I started to preach out of the Bible. I just used text, just like he did. And it was because of what he had to say, and because of what we're about to learn about this sermon, that changed the way I thought about preaching. And I wanted to share that with you tonight. Not out of here, but I do want to share it with you, because that's liable to explode at any moment. At any rate, um, as we get ready to take a look at Peter, P- Peter's sermon, and of course, Brother Ray was a lot more eloquent than myself. I st- stumble over my tongue. But at any rate, as we get ready to look at Peter's sermon, I want to make sure that we understand beyond a shadow of a doubt with the coming of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of chapter 2 uh, and these men being filled with not only the ability to speak in all the languages of the men assembled in Jerusalem on this day, but the words that they're going to speak are not of their origin. This is not Peter's sermon. This is God's sermon. And I hope to impress that upon you tonight. This is God's sermon. As these men are speaking as the Spirit, promised to them as moving them, sharing with them, revealing to them, reminding them, It is God's words. It is God's power alongside of these words. It is God's prophecy that is opening this sermon, sharing that God talked about this hundreds of years before in intricacy, as we're going to talk about tonight when we get back into the text. This is God's sermon. Sermon has a title, and it's the name that's above every name. 
In verse 22, it starts off with Jesus of Nazareth. As Peter shares prophecy and then comes back to the topic, he's going to share that not only was this day what Joel talked about, but the Messiah's kingdom is the Jesus that you knew from Nazareth that you killed. When you get down to verse 36, we have an introduction of a new name. This Jesus whom you have crucified is now both Lord and Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 tells us this is the name God gave him that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee will bow whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth. The total consumption of power located in one place in the name of Jesus. From this sermon, we're going to look at just briefly eight things, eight things from God's sermon that preaching should do. Should do. Okay? Now, this is God's sermon. And if it is God's, it should be, in essence, perfect. Yes? Should be no doubt about that. So what we learn from his preaching is something that we should want emulated, yes? Okay, good. Number one, the very first thing that we learn from God's preaching is it discusses and explains Scripture. Discusses and explains Scripture. Starting in verse 1 uh, all the way down to verse 35, Luke is sharing not only the events just for the sake of sharing with us what's happened, but also for sharing with us the fulfillment of all things that was promised. From Jesus promising his disciples the Holy Spirit that he shared with them before he was arrested and subsequently put to death, to what the prophets spoke about concerning the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom being fulfilled and Jesus being on the throne on the right hand of his father, the throne of, that was promised to David, eternal throne that was promised to David, not an earthly throne, sitting on that right hand, ready now for the kingdom to begin. It's explaining all of these things, including when he says, this is what the prophet Joel spoke and explains the pouring out of the Spirit on all mankind. And the beginning of this, through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it's a good note to write down. Paul says it was through the foolishness of the message preached God chose to save the world. Now, it was foolish to those who thought it should be something more grandiose. Everybody wants God to come to them in some great burning bush moment or uh, some great catastrophe in, in physical nature or movement in physical nature, but it was through the message preached, God chose. What does Mark 16 say? Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not. By their choice, God remains righteous. By their choice, they are condemned. This is with the methodology that God chose. Why? Because it comes to everyone equally. All of us have the ability to hear it, understand it, and choose for ourselves whether to give ourselves to it wholly or not. Pretty simple, right? Everybody can come to God on the exact same terms. Why? God is not a respecter of persons. Peter's going to make a big deal about that in chapter 10, being sent to uh, the first uncircumcised Gentile to convert him from just a knowledge of God into serving God through Christ Jesus. See? Peter's going to make a big deal about the fact that God shows no partiality. Now, if he were to come to Kevin and massage Kevin's heart different than he does everybody else, what does that make God? A respecter of persons, doesn't it? People don't think about these things when they spout such nonsense, do they? Always remember when men share their ideology, it always belittles God. Always. To that end, explaining scripture is what preaching should do. That's why preaching from text. Who was it written to? When was it written? Why? What can we learn from 
what was written to them for the purposes it was written to them for. What can we garner from it? How can it improve our service, you see? Some of the points in explaining Scripture is God showed his power in the coming of the Spirit. This, in turn, garnered an audience. You see how explaining Luke's version of this from the hearer's understanding helps us understand how important these events were. They weren't random at all. God told them, the Jews, of this day. In Joel, they read from Old Testament passages every Sabbath in the synagogue, from the time that they were wee enough to hear, to come into the synagogue and stand next to their father uh, or sit next to their mother. They had scripture read to them from Isaiah, from the Psalms, from Joel, all concerning the coming of the Messiah and his kingdom. Do not feel sorry for the Jews that they were ignorant. They chose to be like many people today. Everything that they needed to know was in front of them. Paul reminds them of this in Romans chapter 9. As he laments for his people, he says they were given the promises. They were given scripture. They were given the word of God. They chose, you see, to ignore or to create for themselves, uh, Romans chapter 10, create for themselves their own righteousness. People don't do that today at all, do they? Okay. To this end, if we understand that it is truly scripture, it is God's word, we should what? What's that last point? We should hear what he has to say. We should listen. We should want to be advised from our Creator. We should want to be advised from the mind of Christ. Guess why? Who else can help us navigate this world than the one who lived in it perfectly? You ever ask yourself that question? Who else do you want to advise you if not Him? I don't want anybody else. I was always taught in the business world that if you're going to find a mentor, find the best. Well, guess what? In the spiritual world, it should definitely be the best, right? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and through 3. God, in many ways and in uh, different times, spoke to the fathers by the prophets, right? To include talking to Balaam from a donkey, the burning bush moment, all of those things. Yet now he talks to us specifically through who? A singular source, Christ Jesus, the name that's above every name. Revealing to us, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, in the summary of uh, the, one of the greatest explanations of inspiration and the work of the Spirit through human agency, gives us the mind of Christ. This, brethren, is the mind of Christ. Guess where we need to put it? Between our ears. That's the essence of our hearts, just so you know. Okay? You know what? Real quick, I didn't want to spend this much time, but I'm going to, I'm going to do it anyways, because I have your attention, right? To go over to Acts chapter 13. Let's, let's talk about this explaining scripture a little bit more. Look at Acts chapter 13. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we have the first recorded sermon. This is Peter uh, is being recorded by Luke for us, for posterity. But in Acts chapter 13, we have the first recorded sermon of Paul. Now, don't be misled, Paul has preached before this already. It's starting in Damascus, even. Uh, he's going to be converted. He's going to go off into Arabia, which is, by the way, is not the Arabia Peninsula that we talked about last week. It is the area by designation that's just east of Damascus, and it's not a place where you couldn't sustain yourself. It just means it was desolate of people. Okay? But he went out there and spent time, in his own words, in Galatians chapter 1, he went over there and came back to Damascus, then began to preach. And then, of course, we know his preaching got him uh, basically flagged that they started looking for him at the gates, and he had to be let down out of the city walls to escape. He went to Jerusalem uh, in Acts chapter 9, and of course, he knew he had to join with brethren uh, and as he tried to join, they remembered him only as the persecutor of Christians. Barnabas had to stand for him and speak in his behalf. And he began to work with that congregation in Jerusalem. Guess what? Just sitting in a pew. 
he started preaching right away. And he was so, so powerful in his teaching, guess what they wanted to do to him in Jerusalem? Kill him again. And they had to get him out of Jerusalem, and then he goes on a journey from Jerusalem all the way up to Tarsus, where he's from, where Barnabas later is going to go back and retrieve him uh, just before chapter 13, so that he can begin to do the work the Lord has chosen him to do. But in chapter 13, here's his first recorded sermon. Now, I'm not going to read all this, but I do want to point out a couple of things. Look how many times Paul is going to quote from the Old Testament. Uh, verse 22, verse 33, verse 34, verse 35, and again in the summary uh, in verse 40 and 41. Okay? He's going to quote from the Old Testament, not because it was just something he knew a lot about and he just wanted to throw Bible verses at him, because he, in the, in the body of his sermon, guess what he's doing? He's explaining what God spoke before that is happening now. He's explaining Scripture. This was the body of Paul's sermon, was revealing to the Jews everything God had prepared for them to know concerning Jesus, the Messiah. Flip over to chapter 17. Paul's going to come to Thessalonica, leaving Philippi. He's going to go through um, Amphipolis, Apollonia, and he's going to come to Thessalonica, and as was his custom, he's going to go into the synagogues and begin. Look at verse 3. No, he's going to go in the synagogue not to support Jewish worship. Look at what he's going to do. Explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. Guess what he's doing? Explaining scripture. What scriptures would they know in the synagogue? Old Testament passages now being fulfilled in the Christ. He's explaining scripture. Proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is that Christ. Chapter 18, he's going to go to Corinth. In Corinth. Oh, what is it? Verse, uh, verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. What do you think reasoning means? He's explaining what? Scripture. He's explaining God's word and the fulfillment thereof and the, the perfect nature of God's purposes in Christ. Look at the very last chapter, chapter 28. Paul's going to come to Rome. Paul thinks when he gets to Rome, he's going to give an answer for Nero concerning charges that were brought against him in Jerusalem. Two years have passed, by the way, since all of this has transpired. He's waited in, in Caesarea now in house arrest for two years. Uh, the governors from Felix to Festus didn't really know what to send him to Rome about, didn't know what to say to Nero. They knew that Nero wasn't going to suffer fools to send him for any old reason, uh, but finally he's going to get sent. By the time he gets there, the Jews that are there, the ones that have brought the charges, don't even know why he's been charged. The only thing they know is that Paul has kind of upset the Jewish world everywhere. Through what? Through what we've already discussed, preaching and reasoning from Scripture. Note verse 23, when he's finally going to be given audience, and when they had appointed him a day, Many came to him at his lodging to whom he explained and solemnly testified of the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. And by the way, sometimes explaining scripture takes some time. Preaching should be about explaining scripture. It's just God's word. This is God's power to save us. Number two, preaching should exalt Christ Jesus. Remember when Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16 what the Spirit was going to accomplish through them? He says he's going to take of what is mine and give it to you, and he will, you will glorify me. Preaching should glorify the Christ. Listen, I got news for you. Even if you preach a sermon on lying, 
you should be glorifying Christ in that sermon. If you preach a sermon on uh, any sin, whatever it may be, you should glorify that Christ is the mind to teach you how to not fall prey to it. You should glorify Christ in all that is spoken from this. It should produce conviction. Conviction. Rather than the first day that you ever assume that whether by your life, whether by your sharing the word of God with somebody, whether your own mind is determined that someone's just not going to hear the truth, you have determined whether or not they can be convicted or not. That's not your job. Your job is to share the truth to everyone, to everyone, with equal enthusiasm. It's the power of God to save anyone. Who am I to determine who should or should not hear it? And the worst sinners are the ones that need it the most. To this end, we should be active in the kingdom, sharing the word of God in order to produce conviction in people's hearts, to come to the conclusion in verse 37, what do I do? What do I do? This should be the power of preaching, to tell how to be saved. Jeremy, go ahead, please. Where it says that he has chosen earthen vessels. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in understanding that, we begin to understand our purpose, our existence. So, Brother Jeremy makes a good point, and if you couldn't hear him on this side, uh, I can barely hear him from my side, but not, not his fault, my fault. Um, Jeremy's talking about the fact that a lot of us don't understand the role of earthen vessels, service in the kingdom as fleshly entities. God has chosen to use us. I want you to just step back a minute and hear that. God has chosen to use us to spread his truth. Now, Grandma used to say, preach a sermon every day and sometimes use words. It's in how we live, not to be hypocrites. Paul talked about that. He disciplined himself daily in 1 Corinthians. So not to be, uh, make the word that he preached void. He, made, he brought great discipline in his life to make sure he lived what he spoke. As a matter of fact, when you get to uh, Acts chapter 20, and he calls the Ephesian elders uh, together, there's a list of points that Paul shares in his message to the Ephesian elders that is worthy of paying attention to, and we'll, we'll spend some time with it when we finally get there, but the very first thing he says, he says, you remember how I lived among you. He was able to talk about his life as a living example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, it says, imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. Did he say imitate me if he was in sin? He says, as I imitate who? Christ Jesus. Good. To this end, we preach sermons in the way we live. Our other obligation is to create relationships and preach and teach. It is to understand that there is a lost men in the world who need to hear the truth. Listen, you can't make anybody believe it. You can't, but you can share God's word to make sure that he remains righteous in all that he does because their choices will convict them and they will answer for themselves. You had something. Human agency. Peter mentions that in 2 Peter chapter 1. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. How many of the apostles of Jesus Christ got rich? We've done this before, right? How many of them got rich? None. Didn't all of them suffer persecution for what they shared? Yes, absolutely. And many Christians to follow them did too. What does that tell you? They weren't in it for their own glory at all, ever. Nor would they receive any personal benefit from anything that they shared, ever. Because what? There was a greater calling than them, the service to God through Christ Jesus, you see. And it was so powerful in their lives, they were willing to risk 
everything, life, limb, property, everything, to share it. Brethren, we need to understand our role of the body of Christ is not to occupy space. We are the tool that God uses to save souls. And when we pray that, Lord, give us a soul that's willing to hear the truth, we better be ready to teach it. Because guess what? God's answering prayers for us all the time. Not to mention how many prayers might be asked by the alien sinner. <laughs> Tell me what to do, Lord. Well, he may not, he doesn't answer correctly because he's got the word. But guess what he may do? He may put me in front of them. I might be an answered prayer. Listen, we know that they don't, that God does not hear the prayer of those who purposefully live in sin. We know that scripture teaches us that. But we, we can't teach the omniscience of God and then to say that he doesn't hear people. You know better. All of this to say is we do need to understand our role. And by the way, telling them how to be saved should never include, I think, I feel, I like, I want. Peter didn't share any personal thoughts in verse 38, did he? No, he said, poignantly, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Why? It was good for all of them. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, to then receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, he says, is to you, to the Jews you're speaking to, and to all who are afar off, which would include the Gentiles in time, everyone. This was the promise made to Abraham, that through his seed, all nations would be blessed. All means all. All. Good. Tell how to enter the Lord's church. Those who gladly received the words were what? Were? Were? They were baptized, okay? Galatians chapter 3, right? You were baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, the church is the body of Christ. You see how all these passages come together and are in unity speaking to us about what it is to be in the kingdom, is to be in Christ, is to be of Christ in such a way as Romans chapter 8 is applicable to us and that we are all heirs through Christ, able to say, Abba, Father, to exhort to obedience. They began right away in verse 42. Verse 42 is they continue in the apostles' doctrine in uh, breaking bread and prayers. This is worship, by the way. They began right away to worship God. What day was it, by the way? First day of the week. We've discussed this, right? First day of the week, they began to worship right away. They began to understand that their life needed to change. I got news for you. Poor Kevin, he sits up front and he gets picked on. But Kevin is not going to change anything by ideations only. It's not going to happen. You might have the greatest ideas in the world, but if you sit right there and don't do anything about them, what good were they? What good were they? The gospel of Jesus Christ is about transformation. You don't think so? Remember, this is God's word, right? Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Paul says, I beseech you. When Paul says, I beseech you, he's saying, oh, please, I hope maybe you might find some time. Is that what he's saying? What does it mean to beseech someone? I command you. This is, this is poignant. I beseech you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Peter says the same thing about us uh, in our service to Christ, to Christ Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2, that we are all holy sacrifices to God. But note the next verse. And do not be conformed to this world, but be what? transformed by the renewing of your mind, okay? Not the renewing of your mind to just some idea you may have. What does it say? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will 
of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at the very last verse of this chapter. And by the way, this, this whole beginning of this third chapter is talking about us, all of us. He's talking to the Corinthians, but it was saved, saved for posterity for you and I. But all of us being a letter. Paul wrote letters. He's talking about the Corinthians' lives as being living letters. Their lives are a letter. If your life was a letter about serving Christ Jesus, how would it read? That's what this chapter is about. He's telling the Corinthians, your life is a letter about living in Christ. Listen to the summary of this. Look at verse 18. But we all, Paul includes himself in that, doesn't he? But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. How does the Spirit work? Right here. What transforms us? Not simple ideations, but obedience to those ideations that come from this. It's not enough just to know the Word of God. It's a much, much more important practice to live the Word of God. Did you hear it? How many times does the Bible, especially the New Testament, talk about us, our life as a walk? It's not that I have a special sachet. No, it's not talking about that at all. It's about how we live. How we live. Our obedience, you see, is our signature that we are in Christ. Unobedient, not in Christ. Obedient, sacrifice, transformation in Christ. You see? It doesn't matter what you say, folks. It matters what you live. I'm sorry, it's just the truth. We have to, have to come to understand these things. It's the only way we're going to be a benefit to anyone else, sharing the truth. Because you have to know the truth. You have to live the truth. You have to have the discipline to begin to change your life to the truth. Say it one more time. James makes a point about that. We are the first fruits of his kind. Good. Uh, so Jeremy says when he sees us, I wish he wouldn't have said see me because I'm kind of ugly, but you get the point. It's not about what I look like. It's about the heart of what we're trying to do in our lives to serve God through Christ. And yes, we should all be desirous to see the image of Christ. By the way, James says that. James... Uh, Somebody over here had a comment? All right. Uh, I'll come back to James. Colossians chapter 3. Absolutely. So to Jeremy's point and to your point, James says that if we are hearers of the word and not doers of the word, we're like a man who looks in the mirror and sees an image and then immediately turns around and forgets the image he saw. Guess what the image that the word of truth gives us to look at in the mirror? Christ. And if we're hearers but not doers, when we turn away and we forget, we become back our old rotten selves, you see. The point of the mirror is to be doers of the word, so not just looking in the mirror, but when we turn away, we continue to see the image in our hearts moving forward. Good, good points, good points. Um, oh, what happened here? All right, to produce unity. Listen, 3,000 souls were added to the apostles on this day through the preaching of this sermon. Uh, because of the adding of these 3,000 souls, you have 3,000 people that may have, may not have known each other before, may have seen each other before, 
Some of them may be related, some of them may not be related, but what I got news for you is you better pay attention to the fact that it changed all of them. And all of them began to elevate purposes in their life greater than themselves. And they began to have all things in common. Now I guarantee you, when Luke wrote that, it wasn't that they all had the same taste in music or the same taste in food or the same uh, taste in clothing. That wasn't what he's referring to. When he talks about they had all things in common, they had something in their life that was more important than them. All of them. Brethren, you want to live and be brethren. You want to live to something greater than yourself. You have to have something greater than yourself to live to. That's the importance of understanding. True unity comes from the understanding of God's teaching, because God only teaches in unity. The language of singular. There is one faith. There is one baptism. One body. We can go to Ephesians chapter 4 and read them all. One Father, one Lord, one. That's the language of unity. One faith, not faiths with an S. There is one gospel. There is one doctrine of Christ. And to have fellowship with the Father and the Son is to know that teaching. One. It's the language of unity. And when everybody elevates that above themselves... It doesn't matter if you're a babe in Christ. It does not matter if you're mature in Christ. All of you are living to glorify God, not you. Unity ensues. It's when people get involved and personal things get elevated and attitudes about individuals become more important than service to God. That's when the trouble comes. Was that one or two? Please say one. Yes? Okay. Dan. He won. So how can we win by imitating him? And sometimes, listen, when you pray, James says, if you want wisdom, ask God for wisdom, but ask in faith. What does that mean? It means that not only can you trust that God can give you wisdom, but you have to do your part in it too, don't you? If you ask for wisdom and you never open God's word, or is it going to come to you? Of course not. There is an expectation of doing your part, understanding that. What Dan's talking about here is important likewise. It is the comprehension that our transformation occurs when we give ourselves completely to this in purity and has the power, the power, folks, to transform us, to change us. Listen, I make no bones about the fact that I have had many times in my life I was not a good man. I openly admit it. I know it. And I am thankful for every moment of God's grace that he allowed me to live through that and see it to the other side and become wise enough to do something different with my life. And I can tell you that serving myself during that time was a waste of time. And I accumulated money and power and all those things. Whoopie do. It had no value. None. At the end of the day, I wasn't good to her. It wasn't good for my kids. The only way I have changed to become anything different is I had to rely on this. And trust me, there was some work to do. I'm telling you, the value is there. Got to give it the time and trust and prayer and faith to allow it to work in your life. People, well, it sounds so hard. Have you done it? Have you tried? No. How do you know? There's nothing greater than to serve someone else. There's no greater feeling in your heart, not from self-gratitude, just to know that you were a benefit. There's nothing better than that. That's what God made us for. He's shared his likeness in us. He acted on our behalf when none of us deserved it. Stay here. We're going without it. And we're going to face the Lord without all that stuff we accumulate.
And ignorance is not going to be an excuse. Because <laughs> it's always self-imposed, right? Last one, produce joy and gladness. And I love this. Not only do these Christians become one in mind in elevating the purposes of God, it created for them not a false euphoria, but an understanding of true purpose. And when you understand your true purpose and you have a true path to walk, these two things are the natural byproduct. You understand why you're here. You understand how to live to it. You understand how to give yourself to it. You then find a sense of joy and gladness. And it's sustainable. Not that you're not going to know persecutions. We, we, know that this is a t we know that this is not what the Lord's talking about. He's not talking about satisfaction of the flesh. He's talking about a joy and gladness and contentment in your relationship with your creator. And yes, because you have that contentment with him, you are going to know trouble in the flesh. Because the people whose conscience you damage are going to treat you poorly for it. You should know that. It's a realism. Paul was going to tell the brethren that in the churches he established in his first journey that through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom. Acts chapter 14. Many tribulations. He told them outright, up front, that this is going to be a tough walk. And they obeyed the gospel and served anyway. It was more important. More important. All of this to say is this is what preaching should do for us. This is what God says a sermon should do. Okay? And when we pay attention to this and we strive to attain this, all of us, the presenters, the hearers, are all benefited by God's wisdom. Was this worthy of taking a look at before we started? I hope so. We'll get back to text next week. Lord willing. Thank you.